Good evening. My name is Ben Grundy and I will be your Master of Ceremonies tonight. I'm also a Global Social Benefit Institute Fellow and will be presenting my work with PsychoConnect. But first, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. We pause to acknowledge that Santa Clara University sits on the land of the Ohlone and Muwekma Ohlone people who trace their ancestry through the Mission Dolores, Santa Clara and San Jose. We remember their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, learn and pray on their traditional homeland. Let us take a moment of silence to pay respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people of the past and present. It is my pleasure to now introduce Bridget Helms, the Executive Director of the Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship. For there is always light if we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. This invitation by the inaugural Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman, to be part of the solution during these unparalleled times really resonates with me personally. As the relatively new leader of Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship. You know, I'm a Bronco myself and I was profoundly influenced by my experience here at SCU. It really set the course for my entire career. And tonight, you will see how these amazing students have created impact in the world and how their experiences have impacted them as human beings. Over the past 10 months, these fellows have devoted themselves to learning about social entrepreneurship, spent countless hours engaging our social enterprise partners on Zoom to assess their needs and to, to design their, their projects together. They've written and delivered super practical and useful research projects of real value to these uh, social enterprises. And all through this process, they've developed their skills in, for discerning their own vocation, their own life paths. These accomplishments of these fellows show us how through social entrepreneurship, we can all be part of the solution to poverty, injustice, and climate change. I encourage you to visit the breakout groups that we'll have shortly and bring your questions to these social to the to the fellows and ask them things like, you know, how did you contribute to the mission of these social enterprises? And more, more importantly, how the, how the heck did you do it in the middle of a global pandemic? And what did you learn about your own vocation to be part of the solution? When I returned to Santa Clara last summer, one of my top priorities was to explore ways that we can further weave social entrepreneurship into the DNA of what it means to be a Bronca. As we look to scale Miller Center more broadly over the coming years, we recognize the immense potential and the need to scale our impact within the university and the university's impact within Miller Center. These fellows are pioneers in this effort. In essence, their work is like a proof of concept for how Santa Clara University can uniquely fuse the entrepreneurial spirit of Silicon Valley with the university's Jesuit values of service to the poor and global impact. Let us together tonight learn more about what these fellows have been up to, their journey, celebrate their accomplishments, and imagine how we might fashion a future that reflects the values of our university to be part of the solution. To the parents, family, and friends of these fellows, thank you. Thank you for supporting them on their journey. We are immensely proud of them, their accomplishments, and we look forward to celebrating together with you this evening. Thank you. And now I would like to ask uh, Father Kevin O'Brien to come onto the stage. Great, uh, thanks Bridget. It's uh, great to be with uh, you all here tonight. Uh, Bridget, thanks for your leadership of the 
of the Miller Center and to Jeff and Karen Miller for all their support. And uh, so many on this call who have supported the work, particularly of the, uh, the Global Fellows Program. I, you know, I became president of Santa Clara in the summer of 2019. And one of like just weeks after taking office, I went to Africa and to East Africa to Nairobi to visit uh, the fellows who are on the ground in Nairobi and in some of these surrounding areas at their at their social enterprises, and it was really a uh, a really great introduction to uh, what Santa Clara is all about. As Bridget said, you know, putting your Jesuit education into action, um, putting your faith into action, um, trying to build trying to build a more just and gentle and sustainable world, but not as uh, messiahs or saviors, but always in collaboration with other people particularly those on the ground who live and work and labor in, uh, in, a, in a certain context in which we are guests and in which we are not simply providers of service or information, but also learners. So that type of solidarity is so, so important to the work of, uh, of the global social, the global fellows, global, global social benefit fellows and the work of the Miller Center. So I'm just so happy to be here. I'm sorry we're not all together because usually it's a really fun night to see everyone in sort of a reunion, to meet everyone's parents. A shout out to our parents who are who are listening and watching tonight. Uh, um, we'd like to have your uh, your kids back on campus. We're working towards that very soon, God willing, um, uh, as the trends look better for us in this area. So uh, so thank you for everything you've done uh, to nurture and raise such exceptional such such exceptional young men and women. Uh, which have uh, both keen minds and very, very compassionate hearts and ready hands and feet to do the work. So thanks, great to be with you all tonight and I'll see you in the breakout rooms. God bless, go Broncos. Okay, just got the okay from Ben. Um, welcome again, everyone, and thanks for being here. I'm Skylar Creasy, your host for this session and former GSBF. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The session is being recorded, so if you would not like your video to show in the playback, please turn your camera off. Uh, the session will be about 15 minutes long, including Q&A, and I encourage everyone to post questions to the chat window throughout the presentation. Um, I'll be reading from the list asked Ben once he's finished. And we might not have time for him to answer every question, but I'll do my best to uh, combine questions so we make the most of the time. Um, next, I'd like to remind everyone that there will be a five minute break uh, between this session and the next of group sessions. And finally, the whole event, as well as the sessions, will be made available on YouTube in the coming weeks. So keep out an eye out on your email for those links. And with that, I'll pass it over to Ben. Thank you and enjoy the presentation. Thanks, Skylar. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. I have a, a video that's going to be playing in the background, so <laughs> people have something else to look at other than my face all the way zoomed in. Is uh, the video on the screen for everyone? Yep. Perfect. Sounds good. So I'm going to open my presentation with Jess a little bit about who I am. So my name is Ben Grundy, and I am a current, current senior environmental science and political science double major. And I would consider myself to be a change maker. I am someone who is looking to make a real difference in the world. And that's part of the reason why I was drawn to the Global Social Benefit Fellowship. I saw an opportunity for both vocational discernment, so that's figuring out what I wanna do with my career, but also a real opportunity for action research. So regarding vocational discernment, I'm, at least at the moment, I'm interested in pursuing a career in sustainable international development. And I saw the fellowship as an opportunity to learn more about the behind the scenes of what it means to run an impact driven enterprise. And then as for action, action research, I learned that it is important to always remember the agency of the human person and to work with not just for communities. So I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to work with PsychoConnect which is a microfinance organization based in Uganda that provides productive asset based loans to rural, rural and smallholder farmers. So essentially what PsychoConnect is aiming to do is to increase the incomes of smallholder farmers by teaching them financial literacy as well as technical literacy for their assets. 
So CycleConnect's main assets in their portfolio are the oxen and plow, bicycles, motorcycles, and grinding machines. But for my specific project, I was focusing on the bicycle asset and oxen and plow assets. So there was a pretty large scope of our project to begin with, given the circumstances of the pandemic, things began changing, the needs of the organization began shifting. And thankfully, we had some pretty clear guidance from Molly Burke, who is the CEO of CycleConnect, and she said that their main need was they needed an updated training curriculum that would help their clients reach higher levels of financial literacy and that they're able to use these assets most efficiently. So essentially what was going on was clients were receiving these assets, but she had the feeling that they might not be getting the most out of them. They had the oxen and plow, but do they know how to rent out the oxen and plow? Do they know how to maintain the oxen and plow for vet fees and plan for all of those unexpected costs? So as a non-business major, learning and creating and navigating a business model was definitely something that was difficult in the beginning. But thankfully, um, my partner Katie had a strong business background and I had some help along the way from a friend of the Miller Center in Jose and then also help from Keith and Dr. Carroll. Uh, they helped me sort of gain the necessary skills to develop that business oriented mindset. And after mapping and modeling the impact in financials of PsychoConnect, we had to identify the specific need and learn how we were going to develop a stronger training curriculum and stronger client-centric processes um, to deepen social impact for farmers. And this is a task that began in the summer. So the fellowship process began in the March, uh, in March of 2020, and we've been running ever since. Um, but starting in the summer, that's when we really we really began getting our work done and making, making movement on uh, reaching our deliverables. And the biggest takeaway from the fellowship overall is definitely the need to be flexible, especially given the, the unprecedented circumstance that we we're all faced with. There is an additional level of flexibility that just comes with being a fellow. And that's the idea of needing to go through the trial and error process. And there's a lesson that I learned. It's actually something that my dad told me. It's the idea of needing to fail forward. Um, not every idea is going to be a great idea, but if you have an unsuccessful idea, you need to run with it. You need to grow from it. You need to learn from it. And that's definitely something that Katie and I had to do in the early stages of this fellowship process. Um, we relied a lot on employee knowledge. We had 7 a.m. Zoom meetings. We had to navigate that 11 hour time difference. So when they were getting off work, we were waking up and just navigating that was a little difficult in the beginning. Um, we set up mock training sessions with PsychoConnect employees where they would run through um, a training session as if we were the client so we can get a real gauge of what they were actually doing in the field, given that we had lost that in-field component that's so crucial to the fellowship experience. Uh, but we were also able to benefit from the use of new technologies like Zoom in the first place. We were able to conduct these meetings with people across the world who we otherwise might not have been able to do without the use of Zoom and also communicate effectively with employees and clients through the use of surveys and um, additional interviews. One of the first ideas that we attempted uh, to create to help meet the need of PsychoConnect was the idea of a video playlist. So talking with Dr. Carol and Katie, we thought, hmm, why, rather than create all new videos for CycleConnect, let's see if we can, we can crowdsource. Are there any videos already out there that are teaching clients how to use oxen and plow or teaching clients how to maintain a bicycle? And yes and no. Uh, I probably spent hours on YouTube looking up videos of oxen and plow. So uh, there's definitely videos available, but the struggle was clients would not have access to these videos because we learned that the majority of clients do not have consistent access to a mobile phone. So while it's a requirement to have some form of contact with PsychoConnect just to uh, facilitate loan requirements and things like that, um, oftentimes clients just have a friend or a neighbor that has a phone and they'll write them down um, as their source of contact. So the video idea, we had to toss it out the window and move on. Um, and then we moved on to the idea of doing a survey through telecommunications because we wanted to see what do clients think they need to know? What do they actually know? Let's get a real gauge of what clients understand and don't understand. And again, we were met with another obstacle because we found out that the traditional, the traditional American idea of having a telecommunication service where you call someone on the phone, you say, please press one if you agree or disagree, press two, press three. 
um, that sort of option system isn't something that's common in Uganda. So that was something that Molly and Emmy and the PsychoConnect team were a little wary about because they're unsure if clients would be able to successfully complete these um, telecommunication surveys. So after we moved away from both the video playlist and the telecommunication survey, we finally settled on the idea of a workbook. And we settled on the, on the idea of a workbook because we realized that PsychoConnect had a problem communicating between multiple levels of the organization. Um, and we discovered this because we send out a survey to PsychoConnect employees, the loan officers who are going into the field and doing the trainings. And they had mentioned that one, clients know about 75% of the information already that they're presenting in these training sessions. And two, that they feel a need for more engagement and more refreshment. The, client, uh, the employees felt the need that they needed refreshers on the material that they were distributing to clients. So we thought that the workbook could fill this void. The workbook could be an opportunity for clients to have something tangible as all loan officers have tablets. So they could always have the workbook on their tablet and review it in their free time, as well as use these workbooks to guide them throughout their training sessions through a variety of engagement activities that we created throughout the process. And another thing we learned was that the education system in Uganda tends to be a lot of dictation and not a lot of uh, free form speaking and guidelines. So in our one-on-one -on -one presentations with um, PsychoConnect loan officers, we were noticing that there was a lot of just following directly from their PowerPoint slides, word for word. And we felt that this isn't the best way to facilitate a collaborative learning environment with clients if you're really looking to um, bring them towards those financial literacy goals that you're wanting. Um, so with a clear direction and a clear goal, we began working on these deliverables. And that also came with a unique set of challenges. One is navigating the language barrier. Um, thankfully, the majority of our contact was with people that were familiar with um, the language, but there was also very different dialects, or there's two main dialects of um, the language in Uganda. So there was difficulty sort of navigating who's the best point of contact to deal with certain issues. Um, so if we had a question about a bicycle, the mechanic might not be the best person to go to because um, the mechanic that works for CycleConnect uh, is not too fluent in English. Um, in addition, we learned that there are some terms and some phrases that are very unique to um, English understanding. So Dr. Carol and I probably spent multiple hours trying to figure out just what the bicycle looked like and what bicycle they were giving out to their clients because we were reading through the protocol and Dr. Carr, I remember he had highlighted all these things in our notes and it's like, okay, the bicycle can't have an engine. They say it has shocks. They say you can't get it wet. So we weren't sure if we were dealing with a motorcycle, with a bicycle. So we had to take some time and set up a meeting with Fred, who is one of the managers at uh, a PsychoConnect office and he broke it down. And then I'd mentioned, oh, like, is there an engine on the bicycle? And he said, yes, there's an engine on the bicycle. And I went back to Dr. Crow and I said, they say there's an engine on the bicycle until finally we were able to break that barrier of communication and uh, figure out some mutual terms and assure some mutual understanding uh, so that we could produce the, the best product and most accurate training information um, that we needed. And thankfully, in addition to the workbook, we recognized that a diagnostic quiz might be something that would be beneficial to allow PsychoConnect to ensure that their employees were keeping up with the knowledge. So the idea was we would have a diagnostic quiz that would accompany each bicycle module. So if a client was doing, say, the bicycle training and maintenance when they deliver their asset to clients, there would be a follow-up presentation or follow-up diagnostic quiz to ensure that the correct information was given to clients. And this idea was just to ensure that clients were getting the most accurate information and ensure that the information that was being disseminated from PsychoConnect to their employees was accurately being distributed to clients. Uh, so in addition to the workbook, we also created the diagnostic quiz to accompany the bicycle workbook. And then along with both of those deliverables, we also created the implementation guide, which served as additional recommendations that we believe that PsychoConnect would benefit from implementing. Um, that can be, they're currently in the process of um, looking to change how they're conducting their training sessions and shifting responsibility of who's uh, disseminating what. Um, so we made some suggestions on how our workbook can actually be transitioned um, to whatever model they choose to move forward with in the coming years. Um, 
Throughout this process, there's a lot of things I learned. Um, I would say that I learned personally about how I am as a worker, but also that I learned about social entrepreneurship in general. And I am so thankful that I had the opportunity to work with all of the people that I was able to in this experience. Um, I wanna give a special shout out to my partner, Katie. She was unfortunately unable to um, continue with uh, this portion of the fellowship um, about halfway through, there was a lot of things going on that required her to step back a little more, but I appreciate all the support she gave me uh, in the beginning and throughout this process. And as for the vocational discernment portion, which I'll touch on quickly just to leave some time for questions, um, this fellowship experience really taught me that I have an interest in the operational side of social entrepreneurship. I like seeing all the pieces of the puzzle fit together to lead to the impact of increasing income and moving uh, clients towards more sustainable livelihoods. Because oftentimes there's this fascination with the end result, with the impact. And it's a great thing to want to move people out of poverty, but it's another thing to understand how to move people out of poverty. Um, so through being able to learn that and understanding how there's all of these different responsibilities and roles, um, I was able to gain a better understanding of a potential career path um, in social entrepreneurship. Wonderful, great presentation, Ben. Uh, we'll now move on to the Q&A. And the first question from the audience is, given the idea of a workbook, what are the thoughts to keep it updated as information comes in? That's a great question. Um, I would say that the workbook allows for a level of flexibility because it can be reviewed and updated with information um, simply by taking the PDF file, converting it to a Word document, and then making the necessary changes. Um, that was actually a, a recommendation that I suggested to Molly in one of our meetings, um, that there is some sort of renewal or some sort of update process and that the workbook is actually reviewed at the end of every year because I begin the workbook with a list of their objectives for, um, I believe I included 2022 as well as 2050. So I suggested that every single year, her and her team go through the workbook and include any updates that they feel would best um, meet their needs and meet their goals at that time. Awesome, thank you. Um, next question is, did you have the chance to interact directly with the clients? Um, and if so, what were your impressions of them? I'm trying to remember correctly. <laughs> there was a lot of different interviews. I believe that most of my interactions were with PsychoConnect employees and I didn't have a lot of interactions with the clients themselves. Um, thankfully, PsychoConnect keeps pretty accurate data and they have a lot of, they do a great job storytelling and telling the stories of their clients. So from my conversations with the employees, I was able to gain an understanding of what type of client is coming to work with PsychoConnect. Um, so while I didn't have direct contact with the client, say through, through interviews or one-on-one or -on -one conversations, I feel I was definitely able to gain an understanding of who that target audience is by my inner, or through my interactions with the PsychoConnect employees. Awesome. Um, unfortunately, that puts us at time for the 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> that's the last question we'll make it to in this session. But um, thank you, everyone, for your attendance and participation in this session. And I'd like to remind you that uh, there's another session after the five minute break, um, which Spencer posted the link um, earlier in the chat, and I can drop it in one more time. Um, and just a reminder to please exit the Zoom call while on the break and enjoy the next session. Good evening. My name is Emma Hakoda and I will be your host for the evening and I was a former 2019 GSVF. Welcome to DIG Development and Gardening's presentation. A couple items to remind everyone of. As mentioned before, this session is being recorded and it will be about 15 minutes long, including the Q&A. There will be a five minute break after this presentation before the next one, so you can go to the bathroom, get some water if you need. 
And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please post them in the chat window and I will read them to the fellows after they're done with their presentation. If there are any other sessions you would have liked to attend, don't worry. As Ben said, everything will be posted online in the coming weeks, so just watch your email for that. And that is all from me. So take it away, Julia and Bryn. Enjoy the presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia, and I'm a senior at Santa Clara. I'm originally from Boulder, Colorado, and it was so great to work with Dig this past summer um, and, and sort of learn about what farmers in the field we're doing as, as Bryn and I, and she'll explain a little bit too, we're planting our own garden back in, in Santa Clara as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Bryn. I am from Denver, Colorado, and I study economics and environmental studies. Um, and it was so great to work with development and gardening um, this past summer. And Julia will explain a little bit more about their mission as well. But it was definitely great to have that overlap between working with development and gardening in the field and living and working with Julia this summer um, in our own garden, so. Perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and share this and then we'll get on our way. Thank you everyone so much to jo for joining us. Um, we appreciate you taking this time uh, and we, we look forward to sharing our story with you. So development and gardening uh, is the enterprise that Bryn and I worked with um, this past summer. And, and development and gardening, more lovingly referred to as, as DIG, um, is a social enterprise that took part in Miller Center's GSBI in 2019 and then hosted fellows for the first time um, this past year. So their mission is to improve the nutrition and livelihoods of uniquely vulnerable individuals living in Kenya, Uganda, and Senegal. Um, and these individuals are living below the poverty line and are often living with HIV, people living with disabilities, um, young mothers, and also refugees. And DIG is cultivating community gardens with these community members and is providing farmer training programs. Um, and to accomplish this, they have both a team working in the field uh, and a team in the U.S. as well. So it was around a year ago today that Bryn and I were both to, uh, assigned to work with development and gardening. And we were so eager and so excited. We were going to have the opportunity to travel to Kenya and work with the farmers to develop a training program so that the enterprise could scale to new communities and to new countries as well, potentially. However, weeks before the start of the fellowship, we all know that COVID-19 began spreading throughout the country and, and, the, the, and the world. Um, and the international component of the fellowship was no longer feasible. So in response, we engaged in conversations with Sarah Koch, who is the executive director of development and gardening, and with the Miller Center team to develop a new project that would address and identify the, the new challenges that the enterprise was facing in light of the pandemic. And so to start, you know, slightly unconventionally in terms of what the fellowship is, we began working as social media managers for the enterprise, collecting and sharing stories that were coming in from farmers in the field and sharing them over DIG's social media platforms. And um, because we were receiving hundreds and hundreds of photos and stories from the field, this position gave us the opportunity to learn more about what was happening in the field, really feel that connection, even though it was a remote connection, feel that connection to the farmers, and also learn more about um, what was happening behind the scenes um, on, on this more business side of, of DIG. Um, and so after actively participating with um, the DIG teams in the field and, and in the US remotely, but actively, uh, Bryn and I recognized a few problems with the enterprise's communication systems and strategies. And so first, we noticed that there was a the process of communication of information uh, from the field to DIG's audience on social media. There were some inefficiencies there. Um, and, and there were also, um, you know, lacking strategies in the way that DIG was using its social media pages to garner the engagement of both donors and potential partners. And so we recognized that if left unaddressed, these problems would prevent the enterprise from future scaling. And now Bryn's gonna describe, um, you know, what we did to address these problems that we identified. Yeah, so all of our research um, over the summer, our action research project and deliverables aim to address the problems that Julia 
mentioned that we identified in the communication systems um, of the enterprise, which of course ultimately um, created some issues in their scaling process. And ultimately we wanted to create solutions that would allow them to expand its programs to um, other farms and scale their impact. And one key finding of our research that we'd like to mention is that the voice of the DIG beneficiaries, um, we've recognized must be the voice of the enterprise as a whole. Um, so when program managers and local facilitators in the field share authentic and detailed stories and images, donors are meaningfully engaged. So it was really important for DIG donors that um, these stories were being shared authentically. And we found that there wasn't necessarily a resource um, for the field managers to understand how to do that quite yet. So we developed a program manager digital storytelling resource, which will guide program managers in capturing quality images and sharing detailed captions for effective digital storytelling over social media. Um, and we also found that consistency in public communications increases professionalism. Um, there's a real need for consistent branding, voice, and style in digital communications, as many of us may know. And the style guide in our social media manager guidebook, which was one of our final deliverables, will allow DIG to establish consistency. Um, although the, the social media accounts are run by different individuals at different times who have varying levels of familiarity with DIG. And the other elements of our deliverables, um, which will be available to view on the GSBF website are the uh, digital strategy guide and the social media manager responsibilities guide. Um, and one of Julia and I's favorite takeaways from the research and the work that we did is that DIG needs to be collaborating more with its large network of partner organizations, chefs and board members to create and share content. Um, DIG with, works with so many incredible people and organizations who are always more than happy to contribute to their mission. So capitalizing on that will be a key element to growing their reach and ultimately growing their donor base to create more gardens. Um, and we met a, really, a lot of incredible people in that process of finding that out from various chefs who have worked with DIG in the past. So um, that was a really great process for us. And together, all of these deliverables will be a part of the solution to strengthen DIG's internal and external communications. And Dig has mentioned to us that they're planning to hire a social media manager soon, which will be a really great opportunity for our proposed strategies to be executed. Another um, really unique aspect of the fellowship that we wanted to discuss tonight um, is that we are encouraged to go through a process called vocational discernment, which is something that Bridget made reference to um, during the opening ceremony, um, essentially, which is where we develop an idea of how we'd like to apply social entrepreneurship or skills that we've learned in the fellowship throughout the rest of our lives. Um, so we've worked as a cohort and with mentors to work through these really difficult um, questions. And I'm so grateful to have Julia throughout that process for myself. And the culmination of that process for us um, was a group of interdisciplinary environmental studies and science students in the fellowship doing a video cast series to discuss how each of us are planning to apply social entrepreneurship and what opportunities we'd like to pursue in the future. Um, so I know for me, the fellowship really underlined the fact that I'd like to continue to you know, challenge unjust equilibriums and create social and environmental impact in whatever I decide to pursue in the future. Um, and it also showed me that there are so many different people rethinking the way that we do business um, to forward sustainable development. Understanding where I fit into that process has been a really, really great aspect of um, the fellowship for me. So moving forward, I'm personally interested in pursuing a career in impact investing or impact measuring. Um, and both of these paths for me were really informed by my time as a fellow. So I'm really grateful for that entire experience and all of the support we've received throughout that process. Exactly. And, and Bryn, building off of what you said, I think something for me that was um, very formative in, in the reflection process um, and in sort of looking at how now my experience in the fellowship is really propelling me forward, um, it actually revolved around looking back at a component of the fellowship that was lost as a result of the pandemic. I am a very passionate gardener. I'm really interested in in sustainable urban agriculture. And I was so excited for the opportunity to work with farmers in the field and learn about how 
sustainable farming can be implemented on a global scale. Uh, and, and, you know, with the, with the transition to the fellowship being remote, Bryn and I got the opportunity to work a lot more with the executives and, and with the sort of business side of the enterprise, something that I hadn't been exposed to really at all prior in, in my life. And so this new exposure to the business side of things and, and the opportunity to merge uh, in the environment and, and agriculture and business was really you know, eye-opening and informative to me. And now that's something that I am looking to pursue um, potentially after graduation. I'm coming to Bryn with questions about the circular economy and impact investing, and, and I'm really eager to learn more about social enterprises and, and how they can work to um, implement real solutions to our food system and, and benefit communities. So the fact that something, there was a, this loss that we all experienced, but it ended up being a real gain in, in my mind um, that now is really having a really positive impact on, on what I'm looking to do in the future. Um, so I know Bryn and I are so grateful for the experience and the learning that we had with DIG, a lot of adaptability, a lot of dealing with new ambiguous situations and working really collaboratively with the two women who, who are running the enterprise right now and also with the farmers and the field managers. So um, we're so grateful for the learning that came from that. We're so grateful to hear and so excited to hear that our deliverables, uh, you know, that, that Sarah Koch is really excited about the, the, the deliverables, that they're looking to hire a, a new social media manager using what we produced um, and that Bryn and I will be able to move forward with everything we gained from this fellowship um, and seek other opportunities in, in agriculture and in, in environmental work and social entrepreneurship um, and social enterprise work in the future. Absolutely. And both of our vocational discernment materials as well as our um, final GSBF deliverables will be publicly available on the website. So if you're interested in seeing any of those, be sure to check those out. Um, and I think we'd love to hear your questions as well. And you can feel free to put those in the chat if you have any. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Julie and Brent. That was an awesome presentation. It was great to hear about your experience. Um, so it looks like we have one question in the chat so far, so I will read that out. The question is, what were the special challenges of communicating the part of the message about how severely disadvantaged the selected farmers are? Yeah, I think this was something that we tied. That's definitely um, was a challenge, and that was something that came up in our resource to the program managers who are living in the field and telling their stories um, and asking them to include a lot of details about the background, not only what someone is doing in a specific photo and providing context about that photo, but um, really encouraging them to share the stories of the farmers um, because it is definitely a challenge to communicate that. And so having as many details as possible was um, an important aspect of that. Mm -hmm. And building off of that as well, I think, what DIG does that Bryn and I were both so impressed by and really wanted to share on the social media profiles and, and in all forms of external communication is how much DIG caters its programs to the specific needs of, of the individuals. And so because of that, the benefits that these individuals are experiencing from these programs that are directly catered to them uh, is really special to share. Um, and so sharing, um, you know, the specific um, solutions that DIG is developing to address these problems um, and the impact that that's having in the community. Um, it looks like Father O'Brien wants to know how you negotiated the time difference working with um, these communities across, across the ocean. <laughs> we woke up sometimes maybe 5, 6 a.m. to get on some calls um, and it would always be you know, a, a rough wake up, but we felt really energized from the calls. I think that was something that Bryn and I felt really energized by throughout the entire fellowship was the, the opportunity to communicate WhatsApp, uh, you know, a, a call that was sometimes a little blurry or hard to understand or, or the internet connection was going in and out both on our end and, and on the other end, um, but really energized by those interactions. But um, definitely, having to uh, be patient in, in the time that it took um, for responses to happen, um, and also a, a couple early mornings. 
Great. Well, I just want to be cognizant um, of the time we've got about, we're cutting into our break a little bit right now. So um, I just want to encourage everyone to take that break if you need it. Um, we've got about three minutes until the next session starts. So if you have any additional questions for Julia and Bryn, as you know, like everything will be emailed and posted and recorded. So you can check that out in the future. So thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. While we wait for people to join, my name is Avery. I am a GSBF alum from the cohort of 2019, and I'll be moderating for Aaron and Marissa as they present about their experience with the fellowship and working with Eggpreneur tonight. Thank you so much for all of you for coming. We really appreciate you coming tonight and taking the time to attend this session. These fellows have worked really, really hard. Um, and like Ben mentioned, this will be recorded. So feel free to keep your video on or off, whatever works best for you. Um, and at the end of Aaron and Marissa's presentation, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. So as they're speaking, post any questions you might have in the chat button and I'll be facilitating those questions at the end. Um, so now it's 6.42 and I'll let the fellows get started. Thank you, Avery. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Erin. I'm from Fayetteville, Georgia, and I'm majoring in ethnic studies, and I have a minor also in international business. And I'm Marissa. I'm originally from Ponape in the Federated States of Micronesia, and I'm pursuing a double major in environmental science and women and gender studies. Over the last 10 months, Marissa and I have had the pleasure of working with Eggpreneur, its founder, Matt Dixon, uh, the Little Sisters of St. Francis in Jinja, Uganda, as well as the Assumption Sisters of Eldoret in Kenya. So Eggpreneur is a social enterprise whose mission is to empower women and promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth in remote rural areas. They do this by training women to create and maintain their own sustainable poultry farming enterprises that can be used to support beneficiaries, their families, and their communities. Eggpreneur partnered with the Sisters Blended Value Project recently, and this project provides Catholic sisters with opportunities to learn about social entrepreneurship by partnering with enterprises such as Eggpreneur. In our case, we worked with the sisters who participated in Eggpreneur's six month apprenticeship program and continued on to an accelerator program with the Miller Center. These two training programs prepared the sisters to start their own enterprises and disperse the information they learned to other members of their communities. The onset of the pandemic essentially shook up the world and our initial research plans were no exception. Even though the shift to working remotely and digitally came as a disappointment, it did not diminish what we were able to accomplish through the GSBF. It even presented opportunities that might not have been apparent had we been working in person. First, we were very fortunate to have planned for collecting our data primarily through interviews, which we were still able to do through Zoom. Also, because our project focused specifically on working with the Catholic sisters who had completed Eggpreneur's apprenticeship, we were able to limit the number of people we needed to interview to six individual sisters. This manageable number allowed us to get an in-depth peek into their experiences with the program and gave us the pleasure of forming connections and getting to know them along the way. For our interviews, we intentionally set aside time to share stories about ourselves so we could get to know each other and function better as a team. This was a helpful way to forge personal bonds that are usually made outside of our work hours, but doing this on Zoom enabled us to really dive deep into the power of the sister storytelling potential on online platforms, which is something we may have missed if we had been operating in person. So our research questions were developed through conversations and recommendations from Matt Dixon, as well as informal initial feedback from the sisters. Thus, we were able to identify areas for improvement and value additions that we hope to address through our work. First, though Eggpreneur had developed a great apprenticeship program complete with 12 modules of information, the program had only been launched in 2019, making these sisters the very first group to undergo their training. Because social enterprise work in general, and Eggpreneur specifically, is dedicated to a mentality of continuous improvement, we set out to incorporate learner experiences to help the program run more smoothly. 
Our final deliverable for this portion consisted of detailed recommendations for each of the 12 modules based on 75 hours worth of Zoom interviews specifically dedicated to this review. Our presentation of these considerations highlighted strengths, weaknesses, gaps, and then provided specific recommendations for addressing any needs. We relayed this information to members of Eggpreneur's team who were then able to adjust the playbook to better meet the needs of their students. The work we did to collect feedback from the sisters presented a two op twofold opportunity for our advancement. Uh, not only were we able to compile recommendations to revise the playbook, but we were also able to help prepare sisters for their next steps in the Miller Center Accelerator Program. Practically, this meant reviewing and reteaching concepts uh, and information they had initially struggled with or needed to be reminded of to make sure everyone was ready for the program that was designed to build on their prior experiences. Due to a variety of factors, the portions of the training that the sisters experienced the most difficulty with ended up being the modules focused on financial training necessary to run a successful enterprise. This was something we expected going into our research, but the need for additional assistance became clear as we continued our process. So to fulfill this need, we set aside additional time to work with the sisters to address areas of confusion and adjust the financial models to become more user-friendly. Next, we wanted to find a way to make the training program materials more readily accessible for people without access to reliable internet services and for those who are unable to attend in-person training sessions. To facilitate this, we created an extensive workbook that draws on pre-existing training materials to provide an additional training option for our outgrowers. The workbook consists of tools, key lessons, and activities from the apprenticeship playbook and follows the 12 module format and breakdown of the playbook to avoid any other confusion. And the third area of need that we identified and worked to address concerned Eggpreneur's social impact assessment practices. Eggpreneur needed a formal process to obtain quantitative data about their impact on local partner organizations and beneficiaries after they completed Eggpreneur's Sustainable Poultry Farming Apprenticeship Program. These local groups, including the sisters who have launched social enterprises, often hear stories of impact from their beneficiaries through interpersonal interactions, but they lacked a formal system to gather information or assess trends among their beneficiaries. As such, neither Eggpreneur nor its partners could report their impact, nor could they adjust their program to tackle potential issues for their beneficiaries. Because Eggpreneur and the sisters' social enterprises are at different stages of development, we created two stage-appropriate tools for impact assessment. To address Eggpreneur's need for quantitative data, we have designed an impact evaluation survey. The survey gathers data in four main areas social impact, economic impact, sustainability, and UN Sustainable Development Goals. With these emphasis areas, we look at how working with Eggpreneur has impacted the livelihoods of their beneficiaries and the people they interact with. Then, to address the need to report social impact of partner organizations, we developed a two-phase questionnaire to be filled out by individuals on the enterprise team. As the local enterprises become more firmly established, they will eventually graduate to using the survey that was designed for Eggpreneur. And finally, we worked with Eggpreneur who discovered a need to create platforms that beneficiaries, including the sisters, could use to communicate their accomplishments for their own representation and for them to forge new partnerships. Social media presents opportunities to connect with investors, share stories of impact and exercise agency but previous efforts to engage the sisters in social media had failed because they did not build on the strengths embedded within African storytelling and didn't provide adequate technical training or support. Uh, collaborating with the sisters over Zoom gave us a good foundation to begin the journey to create accounts for themselves and their social enterprises on LinkedIn and Twitter for the purpose of sharing their stories. And both the Little Sisters of St. Francis and the Assumption Sisters of Eldoret now have robust active LinkedIn accounts for their social enterprises. Using the accounts, uh, the sisters will be able to maintain accountability for their social enterprise work and continue to connect with potential partners and beneficiaries. So during our process of working with the groups from the Little Sisters of St. Francis and the Assumption Sisters of Eldoret, the sisters received some, a wonderful opportunity to apply for funding from the Nancy Audubonny Impact Investment Fund. Some of the required components for the application involved having processes in place for assessing and then reporting social impact through social media, 
as well as fully fleshed out financial models, which help them to prepare a justifiable ask, all of which we helped the sisters establish through our fellowship. I'm very excited to share that both of the sister congregations that we worked with, as well as three other associated congregations, have received funding through this Audubon Fund. The financial resources are already in the sisters' possessions, and the Assumption Sisters have already used some of that money to purchase an in an incubator that will significantly propel their social enterprises effectiveness and reach. Now we would love to share with you all a video that Sister Christine and her fellow sisters put together that expresses their gratitude to the Audubon Fund and shares their plans for the incubator. Our joy as a congregation on the reception of the incubator from the funds granted by Otoboni Fund. And the postlands have this to say. Hello, viewers. We are postlands of the Assumption Sisters of Eldoret, and we have been assisting in taking care of poultry initiative. We have benefiting, benefited so much, more especially in gaining the skills in poultry farming, eggs and also meat as its product. Today we are encouraged because we are seeing the social enterprise growing. As you can see, today we are receiving the incubator that we are going to hatch our own chicks in our own farm and also to sell them in the local women in Turbo region. Thank you. On behalf of the Assumption Sisters of Eldoret, we are very grateful to God that Otoboni Fund have enabled us to receive this incubator. It will help us to take care of our elder sisters, our growing sisters, and the community at large. Welcome. Oh, it us to for watching uh, our presentation and that video. Um, I think now it's time for questions, Avery. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, the first question comes from Holly who says, what were some of your biggest challenges in conducting interviews remotely and how did you overcome those challenges? I think um, when we first started I think Marissa and I thought scheduling would be very much like how we schedule, like using Google Calendar um, and just sending appointments. And that was that's not always the case and it's not always the easiest way to communicate with the sisters. Um, so some of the things that we did to adjust were mostly sending messages through WhatsApp and um, always making sure to be ready to adapt in case somebody's internet suddenly went out um, so we learned to be very flexible uh, throughout our interviews and through conducting ourselves on Zoom. Marissa, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Yeah, I think just echoing what Erin has said, it's a big process of learning to be flexible and learning to work with where the sisters are and what works best with them for them, as opposed to trying to infringe on their processes a little bit too much. So. Okay, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so I'll go for the next one, which is, on the other hand, what did you find most gratifying about this experience? Um, I would definitely say one of the most gratifying experiences of being a Global Social Benefit Fellow is just knowing that the work that you are doing is being implemented, that it's 
adding value to an organization and to people who are so wonderful and grateful and genuine and um, yeah, feeling like the work is being practically applied has been very gratifying. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that said, thank you all for coming and enjoy the presentation by Pearl and Alexa. Let me just make sure they are co-hosts. Looks like everything is good to go. Great. Thank you so much, Avery. So I'm going to share my screen really quick so you guys can see um, just so we have something to look at <laughs> while we're presenting. Great. So um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for choosing to come to our breakout room and listen to the work that Pearl and I did over the last, gosh, it's been like 10 months now. So I'm Alexa, and I'm a senior communication and sociology double major. So over the past 10 months, we have been working with Innovation Works Baltimore. So Innovation Works Baltimore is an organization in Baltimore um, that works to close the racial wealth divide that disproportionately affects Black and uh, Latino Baltimore Baltimoreans. Um, so they do this through a handful of different programs um, and have developed a lot of these programs working with the Miller Center. So they use things like Ignite Hubs, which are community organizations to connect with community leaders and social entrepreneurs. They hold a boost workshop, typically in person, but due to the current conditions, it was conducted online most recently. Um, and that Boost Workshop connects different entrepreneurs with resources and mentors and everything that they might need to work on their ideas and work on their social enterprises. They also use the GSBI online curriculum that provides additional resources and curriculum information um, to progress their organization. Um, they also are working on a variety of different initiatives in Baltimore, um, things uh, mostly looking to really work on the local economy. So like I kind of hinted at, there is a close partnership with the Miller Center and Innovation Works, and that includes sharing resources, sharing the mentor network, um, and just generally working between the two organizations to further their missions. So why did we work with Innovation Works Baltimore and what did we do? So Innovation Works is looking to scale their operations outside of the Baltimore area. So what that means is they needed a playbook, which you can see on the screen there, um, that basically writes down all of the key information, the methodology and the different components of the organization so that they essentially have sort of a manual or a guidebook as they're looking to replicate in different locations. So that was what Pearl and I did. Um, we conducted a bunch of research, which Pearl will talk a little bit more about. Um, and we created this playbook. It ended up being very large. It was about 60 pages long and it was a labor of love <laughs> over the course of about 10 months. Um, so our initial plans with the fellowship were to travel to the Baltimore area in the summer of 2020, but COVID happened as we all know. So we were going to conduct that research in person and speak with different social entrepreneurs, the employees and any other stakeholders in a, as a part of the Innovation Works network. However, we were quite lucky in the regard that our research was very able to be done over the Zoom, over the internet. And so we were able to interview um, about two dozen of these different stakeholders and still collect a lot of valuable data um, over these, these past months. So I'm gonna pass it off to Pearl now who's gonna explain our methodology and what, what did we do? to create this, this playbook. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Alexa. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being with us. My name is Pearl. I am a senior public health science and psychology double major with a biology minor. Uh, and I also, like Alexa, had the privilege of working with Innovation Works Baltimore this summer. So Alexa and I, like Alexa said, um, conducted 25 interviews of employees, board members, mentors, and entrepreneurs, uh, and community partners in Innovation Works Network, and administered two quantitative surveys. Data collection focused on stakeholders' experiences of working with Innovation Works and their perception of Innovation Works' impact. 
Um, our data collection investigated the interactions between Innovation Works employees, mentors, and community members in Baltimore. And we documented the pipeline through which Innovation Works organizes its support and what aspect of this support each employee is responsible for. So towards the, this, this was supposed to be taking place throughout the summer. Uh, towards the end of the summer and during the beginning of fall quarter, Alexa and I spent time coding our interviews and analyzing our data. Uh, this allowed us to pull out important themes surrounding how innovation works creates impact and how they can su successfully scale what they have already been doing so successfully uh, in Baltimore. So we created a 10 module playbook documenting Inno innovation works business model, leadership and teams, markets and customers, services and suppliers, marketing and public relations, technology and tech requirements, and financial model. Notably, uh, we detail the steps to replicate each aspect of the Innovation Works model as well. So each module first had a descriptive section uh, that explained what Innovation Works has done uh, in Baltimore and why it has been so successful. And then the module has a prescriptive section that explains key steps for replication um, and an added and how uh, they can adapt their model that's currently in Baltimore to uh, another location in the US. Um, so now Alexa and then myself uh, are going to go into the, some of our key findings. Great, thank you Pearl for that explanation. Um, so just to give a, an overview of the data that we collected and the research that we conducted, I'm just going to give some high level overview of the a couple different modules. So for one, as I hinted at, the mission and impact the mission of Innovation Works is to close the racial wealth divide in Baltimore. So they have essentially, before even creating the uh, organization, the founder, Frank Knott, conducted years worth of research in the Baltimore area, making sure that there was both a need and there would also be an interest in the services that Innovation Works offered. So he spoke with hundreds of the community leaders of the members of the Baltimore area and essentially can collected all of this research to make sure that what he could offer would be something that would be used by these entrepreneurs. And he overwhelmingly found, yes, that this was a resource that could be very valuable to, oh, sorry, someone, there's still people coming in, so I'm admitting them as we're, as we're talking, but um, this overwhelmingly would be a resource that would be useful to the entrepreneurs and the communities um, in Baltimore. So this partnership, um, or this would not have been capable without the partnership with local um, Ignatian folks. There is a tight connection of the uh, IW with the Ignatian values and um, different Jesuits in the area. So that's something notable to point out as well. So he conducted all of this research and applied for funding and began the process of hiring the employees on, which we actually shout out. We have the CEO of Innovation Works here, Jay. Um, he's in the participants in the audience. Just want to say hi, Jay. And thank you for coming and listening to us present. Um, we've really loved working with you and speaking with all the employees and entrepreneurs and everyone else that we could over the past 10 months. So uh, Jay started a career, or excuse me, Frank started uh, hiring on a bunch of folks that would be a part of the core team of Innovation Works. And one of the first hires was Jay who um, is now the CEO. So they began hiring different people for outreach because neighborhood outreach is really a core pillar of Innovation Works's um, methodology and with their connection with the community. So they started hiring a bunch of folks and they got to work. They did a boost workshop and they did the GSBI. The boost workshop was actually one that our fellow Avery was able to go and conduct her project on and see all of the the first inaugural boost and see what was going on there and the type of programs and just write down some suggestions and best practices for going forward for boost. Um, so that was essentially what the research and everything leading up to uh, where we are now looks like. So as I talked about before, Innovation Works does provide a variety of programs for different social entrepreneurs and community members. So those types of programs primarily are intended to connect the entrepreneurs with resources, um, with funding now, with the Ignite Capital uh, arm of Innovation Works that's been established that allows entrepreneurs to apply for funding. This is especially great with the pipeline that Innovation Works has developed, which essentially leads different entrepreneurs through this process of developing their idea and before that even starting and ideating their idea, developing the idea, getting the resources and the connections that they need to make it a reality. 
and later get funding and then scale it at the very end. So these different programs really lead the entrepreneurs through that pipeline. And now at the other end of the pipeline, the very end is the ability to scale. So that's something that's a more of a, a new uh, ability of the Innovation Works uh, network to provide. So like I mentioned before, the Ignite Capital is um, a fund that's being that's opened up to the entrepreneurs that are able to apply for additional funding to scale their operations. And this is just great coming out the other side and seeing the impact of Innovation Works. So those are some of the programs. And like I mentioned, there is a core team of folks that are able to conduct all of these important duties. Um, and so we spoke with lots of them. We spoke with them multiple times and in our playbook just detailed a lot of the different positions and a lot of the value that they bring to the team. So I'm gonna pass that off to Pearl and talk about the great people we talked to. Awesome. So uh, one of our modules was leadership in teams where we really uh, dove in and um, in a lot of detail explained uh, the wonderful team members that are part of the Innovation Works team. Uh, so for my section, since we're already running low on time, I'm just gonna read um, an excerpt from that, uh, which I think really speaks to the heart of Innovation Works um, and just how wonderful all of their team members are. So the employees at Innovation Works are a group of hardworking, dedicated individuals. They all have values that strongly align with the mission of Innovation Works and as such go above and beyond to serve as many entrepreneurs as possible. Each employee takes on both the responsibilities in their position description and additional responsibilities as they arise. These additional responsibilities are to address the needs of Innovation Works Baltimore that arise as they expand, as well as initiatives taken by the employees to find new and innovative ways to build their network and explain and expand their impact. Both of these reasons are direct and indirect reactions to the needs of the communities in Baltimore that they are serving. As such, Innovation Works takes great care to make sure that they are in touch with the needs of the community. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, they hosted a virtual stakeholder engagement happy hour over Zoom for members of their network. This served as both an opportunity for Innovation Works to check in on the needs of their network, as well as offer their continued support to members of their community. Topics of discussion varied widely, but did not shy away from addressing current social issues and injustices. Therefore, Innovation Works drove to make sure that community members felt heard and valued, a key goal of every team member that expands to every conversation they have with their stakeholders. So that's a really quick um, explanation of a really, uh, really complex um, uh, system and that keeps uh, Innovation Works running. But uh, we would love now to open it up uh, to questions that any of you have. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. Uh, and we're happy to keep talking about Innovation Works. Thank you, Pearl and Alexa, and congratulations again on finishing out this incredible fellowship. Looks like we have a question from Florence. She has two questions. Um, number one, did anything surprise you in your research? And number two, if there was one single most important thing to pay attention to to replicate the model, what would that be? I can take the first one because I have a, a great little tidbit that Pearl and I talk about a lot in our research. So um, one thing that surprised me for sure was how much we were able to connect with the community members and the different folks that we were speaking to. I know when COVID happened, we didn't expect to really have the same experience um, that we would have in person. But I think we still were really able to develop relationships with the different people that we interviewed and especially like the community members, the entrepreneurs and the employees. So um, one example, we actually interviewed a social entrepreneur who has a child care center in Baltimore and we had a great conversation with her. And at the end, she told us, oh, you know, with COVID and everything that's going on, oh, sorry, have the dogs barking. Um, but with COVID and everything that's going on, um, I'm conducting these reading um, sessions with the kids that I take care of. And I would love to have you guys on to talk and tell your experience of what California is like. You know, these kids haven't really seen the area before. And I would really love to, to connect with you guys like that. And I think Pearl and I were really struck by how willing people were with us to kind of bring us in and to really just offer us these opportunities to connect more. And I thought that was just, it was really sweet and it stood out to us. Yes, uh, I feel a bit intimidated by the second question because there's so many important things uh, that are involved in replication. Um, I was like, what did we say in our executive summary were the main points? Um, but once you determine a location um, that has a really good fit, 
uh, I think finding a uh, CIO like Jay for Innovation Works Baltimore uh, that is so deeply embedded in the networks there, the community networks is incredibly important. Um, Baltimore has a really strong sense of community identity and that trust is so um, important in their network because people trust other people from Baltimore when they say, hey, Innovation Works is credible, they're a good organization to work with. Uh, and that's what makes Innovation Works work so well or one of the many things. Uh, so finding a CIO that is super embedded in that network um, and already has a lot of trust established with the community uh, is essential. I just want to hop onto that a little bit more. Um, I, I think something really important to replicate the model is the people because that's what really shined to us when we talked with the people who've worked with Innovation Works was just how great of an experience it was because of how dedicated and passionate the employees of Innovation Works would be. So I think really just finding those people who have that drive and that passion that pushes them to connect with more entrepreneurs and really want to do their job well because they know it's, it's for social good and they're working towards this solution of closing the racial wealth divide. So I think that's really what is at the core of Innovation Works is just good people who are able to connect with others and provide resources and knowledge. Wonderful. Um, I think we have time for one more quick question. We're technically in our little break now before the next breakout session starts at 6 p.m. But I just wanted to ask you, Pearl and Alexa, um, what part of the fellowship um, if any influenced your personal vocation or um, what you, how, where you see your own careers going um, after the fellowship? Yeah, um, I think I always knew that I wanted to work uh, directly with the people uh, that I hope to serve. That certainly hasn't changed. Um, and I loved being able to talk uh, and interview uh, the people that work with Innovation Works and like the Innovation Works employees themselves. That was super important to me. Um, so that didn't change it. I think I just became more confident in my own abilities uh, and knowing that there is no one right path on the way to get where I'm going. Uh, as someone who has so many different passions and wants to do it all, do a little bit uh, of everything. I think that uh, I feel so excited to see so many of the different ways that public health uh, is incorporated into our world. I know that in my classes, in my public health classes, we never talk about business as a way to address the social determinants of health. So it was really rewarding to get to see how um, Innovation Works was using business uh, to serve, um, to create impact. That was super cool. Yeah, so for me, I think I really saw how important for my vocation it is to be able to just connect with people. Like Pearl said, um, I think that connection really shows you the value of your work. And it really helped us when we were on page 51 of the playbook, really just trying to get it out. And it became this like very large project that we were so passionate about what we were producing. And we were so passionate about the, the impact it was going to have that it really it made us think about the people that were going to benefit from what we were doing. And that is what adds value to work for me. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for sharing and thank all of you. Go ahead and start. So hi everyone, my name is Caroline. Good to see some familiar faces. Um, I was a fellow back in 2014 with Bandpads in Uganda, so I'm really excited to be introducing you all to Nick and Jasmine, who were fellows at CAD Africa in Uganda. I just want to start out with a couple of housekeeping reminders. So just a reminder, this session is being recorded, so if you'd like to keep your video off, that is perfectly fine. The session is going to be about 15 minutes long, including Q&A, so if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat throughout. There will be about a five minute break after this session before you move into your next breakout room. Um, and just to let you know, all of the sessions will be made available on YouTube, so don't feel like you're missing out. You'll be able to watch them all later. Just keep an eye on your email. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, again, thank you all for coming.
Thank you guys for coming. I'm Jasmine. I was a public health and psychology major at Santa Clara and I'm from Missoula, Montana. I'm uh, Nick Carson. I'm a biology and environmental science major and I'm from Idaho. Um, and again, we'd love to hear your questions. So uh, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll try to get to some at the end of the presentation. Cat Africa envisions a world where young women in East Africa have increased financial independence and are economic drivers in their communities. Cat Africa is a social enterprise that works with young women in rural Uganda who are not able to finish school. They provide passion fruit farms as well as agricultural training and classes in topics like savings, reproductive health, and soon to be trauma management. The program lasts a year and afterwards, the beneficiaries often either choose to continue growing passion fruit for CAD or use the money they saved uh, from their gardens during the program to start a business. In the past, CAD has mainly focused on Ugandan nationals, um, but they're currently in the process of expanding their programs to include the growing population of refugees in Uganda. So the refugees CAD works with have faced significant trauma and loss. Unfortunately, there are no current mental health resources that are culturally competent in Uganda, which leaves trauma-exposed populations like these refugees largely untreated. This creates pretty significant challenges for CAD as an organization because trauma causes a lot of impairment to memory, development, and cognitive processing that are necessary for learning new material. So because girls that are entering the experience have unmanaged trauma, the lesson that CAD is teaching them are not fully utilized and therefore CAD's impact as an organization is mitigated by this trauma. So the purpose of our research with CAD was to understand their beneficiaries' mental health needs and the challenges that they face. And we used this research to inform an original, culturally competent trauma management curriculum to add to the CAD experience. To gain insight into the mental health and trauma experiences of the CAD Africa beneficiaries, we developed an interview guide. Then a local journalist, uh, seen in the photo to the right in the, in the pink shirt, uh, conducted six qualitative group interviews in the local language uh, and transcribed them into English. 35 total beneficiaries were interviewed from both refugee and Ugandan populations. Uh, we then analyzed these transcripts and um, from coding our interviews, our findings fell into five major themes. The first was coping. Uh, we found both adaptive and maladaptive coping strategies and from this, we were better able to determine what effective strategies beneficiaries already employ uh, and which one or and what needs to be addressed during the curriculum. The next theme was relationships. We found that relationships played a major role in the lives of the beneficiaries in both positive and negative ways. In addition, uh, we found that relationships presented different problems for the Ugandans and the refugees. Uh, Ugandans reported high levels of interpersonal violence and marital contentions. Uh, but all reported to having some form of social support. Refugees, on the other hand, reported high levels of loss and very few reported having any form of social support. Uh, mental health symptoms was the third theme that we found. 63% um, of our interviews reported that they were upset by their past experiences on a daily basis, and the remaining felt upset on at least a weekly basis. Across groups, we found that symptoms of dissociation, depersonalization, depression, grief, anxiety, and overthinking were most disruptive to daily life. Uh, refugees who reported more loss and violence than the Ugandan interviewees experienced higher levels of grief and depression, whereas Ugandan beneficiaries reported higher levels of shame and guilt, uh, which coupled with distress from interpersonal relationships as well as lack of education. Uh, our fourth category was stressors. Um, refugees reported unique challenges, often relating to lack of resources, as well as cultural and language barriers. In addition, uh, lack of education was a significant stressor for both groups. Um, our final theme was quality of life. Education comes up here again, uh, as multiple beneficiaries expressed feeling that their lives would be better had they been able to finish school. Sickness and injury was another stressor that affected quality of life. Uh, multiple refugees reported stress due to poor treatment at healthcare facilities, and Ugandan beneficiaries reported stress over lack of funds uh, to pay for treatments. 
We also felt found that the CAD Ac the the existing CAD Africa curriculum offers um, offers tools to to address many of these stressors, but uh, without trauma management, um, they're not fully utilized. So because CAD as an organization doesn't have access to trained psychologists, we focused on trauma management rather than trauma processing for our deliverable design. This means that the lessons included are focused more on skill building and emotional regulation rather than uncovering the source or the details of the trauma that these girls have experienced, which can be a pretty triggering uh, process for a lot of people. So to do this, we leveraged coping strategies that were preferred by the beneficiaries, and we created psychoeducational lessons to teach them about mental health and the way trauma affects their minds and their bodies. So given that 77% of the beneficiaries we interview preferred to deal with their emotions with others, and that 61% of the refugees reported no social support at all, we created lessons that fostered classroom connection and support building skills. Our final deliverable included 15 hour long lessons that adapt a collection of evidence based methods, including mindfulness, guided visualizations, grounding, um, social support building, as I mentioned, and thought reframing. We wanted to create an understanding that trauma is a protective mechanism to reduce stigma and to honor the girls' experiences and strengths as survivors. Because each cohort that CAD works with have different mental health needs and face different challenges, like we saw in our interviews, we made the curriculum modular in design and created a detailed instruction for CAD educators on identifying and planning which lessons should be included for each cohort of girls that go through the CAD experience. So since the curriculum is novel in this setting, uh, it's necessary that it gets piloted in order to make cultural adjustments. In addition, it would be ideal if this is done with the oversight of someone who is central in the creation of the curriculum. Um, so Jasmine will be working with CAD through the initial pilot of the curriculum. Um, so feel free to ask her questions about what that might look like. Um, so if the, if the pilot of the curriculum is successful, it will enhance CAD's current programs and help them increase their impact. As we mentioned before, unmanaged trauma can lead to significant reduction in one's ability to learn. The curriculum will benefit all of CAD's beneficiaries, but will be particularly necessary in meeting the needs of the refugee population they're working with. Implementing this uh, will help CAD even better achieve their mission. Using data from the pilot, as well as the program's impact assess assessment, uh, the curriculum could attract attract investors and aid CAD in earning grants specifically aimed at improving and expanding their trauma resources. Um, if CAD's able to establish a successful trauma management program and attain funding, uh, they may be able to gain access to trained professionals that would be necessary in order to develop uh, full trauma processing resources as well. Uh, implementing this curriculum puts CAD in a unique position as pioneers in this area incorporating a non-Western trauma intervention into their current work as a social enterprise. So going beyond CAD and the implications for them as an organization, as Nick mentioned, currently there's very little research on the effects of trauma in non-Western populations. So this is especially problematic uh, as most of the world's trauma exposed demographics, including refugees are non-Western and therefore have no access to culturally appropriate mental health resources. The curriculum we created is the first trauma intervention of its kind in a cross-cultural setting, which gives it a really unique potential to help a large percentage of the global population that suffers from trauma. If other social organizations who work with survivors of trauma adopted a trauma management curriculum like this one for their programs, the effectiveness of their impacts uh, and their missions would significantly increase just as CADS will with this resource. I'm really excited to continue building on this work during my graduate program next year and continue researching and examining how healing trauma can further accelerate impact globally. I want to say thank you for uh, listening to our presentation. We're now going to transition to answering any questions you guys might have had. 
Great job, you two. So we have a couple questions, one from Keith. So uh, how difficult was it to work with an intermediary, Esther? In other words, without having direct contact with the beneficiaries yourself, and how did you compensate for that? Um, well, working with Esther was definitely, definitely had its, its ups and downs. It was overall like an incredible experience. Um, but, uh, getting over the, the communication gap, um, across the, the large distance and in, in time was, was pretty difficult, but, um, ultimately it was, it was super beneficial to have her, um, she could conduct the interviews in the local language and she knew the culture and was, was definitely, um, a person who, who made these, these women feel more comfortable, um, which was, which is super positive in, in this setting. Yeah, and I just want to add too that just given the remote aspect of our research, I think if we would have tried to do a virtual interview, we would not have gotten any of the information that we did. It was very apparent from reading those transcripts that we got that they really trusted her with their stories and that for us was invaluable in like creating the final product. Oh, I think you might I'm muted. Yep. Do that all the time. But it, it sounds like this initial obstacle of having to go remote actually worked in your favor, perhaps. So that, yeah, that's great to hear. All right, the next question is from Thane. How did you think about traditional African healing approaches in designing your curriculum? So that's a really good question. And I'm gonna kind of nerd out for a minute and talk about trauma. Um, I am really interested in trauma. I've been studying it in a lot of different contexts outside of GSBF. And one of the things that Nick and I spent a lot of time talking about and thinking about when we were making this is how in Western contexts like the US and Europe, we are all about medicalization, which means we like to have a diagnostic and a medical route so that people can have access to treatment, which is works relatively okay in our setting, but that's not how people think about trauma in Uganda. And it actually is very counterproductive. Um, in a lot of ways, it can be really stigmatizing to think that there's something wrong with you, especially if you don't have access to any resources. So what we really focused on, like we mentioned in our presentation was thinking about it um, is like healing as empowering. Like you experience trauma and you're a survivor of trauma, but your body is so strong and your body protected you from all of these things and now you're safe and now you can move on. So that was sort of the approach that we took on. Um, I think something that's also really important to note with this is that given the remote aspect of our research, one of the main reasons why we really need to do a pilot following this is because we were not able to get a lot of the cultural components that we would have needed to make it super well-rounded. So we're really hoping that once we can pilot it through CAD and potentially other organizations as well, um, we'll have a better idea of what cultural adjustments need to be made for it to be more effective in fostering healing. That's beautiful. I love that you're able to um, kind of marry trauma and resilience in your in your program. That's really wonderful. We have one more question. Um, will you be able to train individuals to help with trauma management to those that have taken advantage of the program? So I'm thinking maybe like a peer-to-peer -peer sort of approach. Do you want me to answer this one, Nick, or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, you can go for it. Um, sorry. Had an intruder. Um, yeah, so I think we definitely talked about this a lot. I think that one, it would be really efficient to have like a train the trainer sort of approach to something like this, but given how delicate trauma is and how much attention we really had to place throughout the curriculum on avoiding triggering and being really mindful of certain things. We even have a section in the curric curriculum for the educators um, for their self-care because it is really difficult to lead a class or a curriculum like this. So I think just given how difficult the work is, it would 
be more effective to actually have a professional, somebody with either learning and development experience, education experience, psychoeducation experience. And then eventually, if they do decide to move to trauma processing, um, trained psychologists. But that's a really good question and something that we talked about a lot. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for the questions. We're going to wrap up. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Rachel Hahn, your host for the evening and a former Global Social Benefit Fellow. Welcome to Coco Tech's presentation. A couple items to remind everyone of. Um, the, ses the session is being recorded and will be about 15 minutes long, including question and answer. There will be a five minute break before the next group of sessions. And if you have any questions at all during the presentation, I encourage you to post them in the chat window and the fellows will address them after. If there are other sessions you would have liked to attend, don't worry, the whole event will be posted online on YouTube in the coming week, so just watch your email. And that's all from me, so take it away, Lauren and Izzy. Thank you and enjoy the presentation. Thanks, Rachel. Um, hi, everyone, I'm Lauren Cherry. I'm from Littleton, Colorado, and I'm a senior in a double major studying economics and public health with a minor in biology. Hi everyone, my name is Izzy Silber and I am from Issaquah, Washington. I am a senior this year and a double major studying biology and public health science with a minor in Spanish. So Lauren and I both pursued the Global Social Benefit Fellowship because we're both very excited about um, the opportunity to combine our passions as well as practicing our research skills while also in pursuit of positive social change and sustainable impact. We are especially interested in the fields of public health inequities along with economic development. We really appreciate you all being here today um, and listening to Lauren and I reflect on the past nine months and our um, two engagements, the first with Coco Tech and our current and second engagement with Teach Amanda Fish. So Lauren is gonna start us off by telling you about our work this past summer with Coco Tech. Take it away, Lauren. Thanks, Izzy. Yes, yeah, so um, this past summer and early fall, we worked as consultants with Coco Tech, which is a software development company located in Yangon, Myanmar. Um, and Coco Tech's main application or tool that they have is um, a Facebook app called May May, which is Mother and um, Burmese. And this app provides um, maternal telehealth as well as they're now started to provide COVID information um, to over about 5 million users. So Izzy and I were asked to research and evaluate their user base um, to look at how they can obtain new customer acquisitions. So to address this challenge, we developed about a 20 page onboarding manual for new employees um, to provide marketing and advertising techniques. Um, and to do this, we completed an analysis with um, employee interviews we had um, as well as looking at their current social media content and looking at kind of their competitors in the same region. And through this whole process, we really were focused on applying our findings to the culture and the context of Myanmar. So it's really important to have that in mind. And Izzy and I had a really great time learning more about their culture too. Um, so by working with Coco Tech, it showed us how the integration of health and technology can be a really powerful tool um, to combat health misinformation, which is a really big predominant issue in Myanmar. Um, so we were able to use this powerful tool to also find um, affordable health interventions and kind of see how that worked for them. Um, so we, in addition, were able to look at how to make effective health campaigns and promotion content, which as you probably know with COVID, it's really important right now to look at how you campaign health information properly. Um, so we ended up completing this work with Coco Tech in the fall um, and we really wanted to continue our GSBF experience. And so we started working with two congregations of sisters in Tanzania and Teach a Man to Fish. So Izzy's gonna talk to you a little bit more about that experience. Thanks Lauren, that was a great description. So the second enterprise that we are currently working with is called Teach a Man to Fish. Um, we started working with them kind of at the end of fall quarter and have continued working with them since. We plan to um, continue this work with them pretty much until April or a little bit later. 
Um, so Teach Amanda Fish partners with schools to help them build educational and sustainable school businesses. We are currently mentoring two different schools in Tanzania, in Arusha, Tanzania. Um, and these two schools are both implementing school run poultry farming businesses. Um, both of these schools are run by congregations of Catholic sisters. However, the school businesses themselves are really based in student involvement. So while the Catholic sisters are encouraging the students to build these entrepreneurial skills to build a school business, the, the students are the ones actually running the business. So they're learning quite a lot. Um, and Lauren and I act as peer educators to accompany the sisters um, as they use these educational modules provided by Teach Amanda Fish with the students and um, the development of these successful business ideas and plans. And so to provide a little update on where we are now with this project, the sisters just now submitted, um, successfully submitted their business plans and business ideas to be reviewed by the Miller Center and um, Teach Amanda Fish and considered for seed funding so they can get a bit of started, startup budget um, and pursue the implementation of these school run businesses. And so as this happens, Lauren and I will continue to work with the sisters uh, to evaluate the implementation of their school businesses, as well as developing supplemental information that um, continues to accelerate the sisters into social entrepreneurship. So taking their school businesses and expanding it into school um, enterprises. And it has been, both Lauren and I would say that it has been incredibly warming to work with the sisters and to be able to hear their stories we truly wish we could be there in person, um, but we're lucky that the time we do get to spend with them over Zoom has really allowed us to create deep and um, personal connections with them, way more than we probably would have ever expected. And so we wanted to share some of these stories and images to give you a better sense of our time spent over Zoom with them. Thanks, Izzy. Yeah, so here are just some a few of the photos we've received from the sisters. Um, we're currently working with two schools and Izzy and I right now have very early morning meetings with them. Um, and I think it's, it's always great because Izzy and I are a little groggy trying to get our coffee um, and the sisters are, you know, it's 5 p.m. there. So they have bright smiling faces and always bring so much joy to the conversation um, and it really enlivens Izzy and I and we just love it every week. Um, but as Izzy mentioned, the sisters um, are great storytellers and really have showed us how storytelling can be so important. And we've been able to hear all about their motivations and their passions for sustainable um, school models. And so these Catholic sisters and the teachers are really trying to create schools that have sustainable revenue flows um, that will allow the school to open up to new students. Um, and these students will build entrepreneurial skills, um, set up the students for success and create opportunities and job creations for them even beyond school. Um, and so one of the big tangible skills we've learned is cross-cultural communication. And this is one of our biggest findings that we've had throughout the fellowship and um, part of the academic class side, we were asked to make a professional media asset. And so Izzy and I made a video called the five key things to know about the Global Social Benefit Fellowship. This is really helping um, current juniors see if they would be interested in the fellowship. And we talk about some of our key findings. So we wanted to show you a clip of that um, and you'll see key findings two, three, and four. So our next key finding was something that we were warned about in the application process, that being ambiguity and adaptability. Um, but what we ended up finding was that you really don't know what ambiguity and adaptability is until you go through this fellowship. Um, Lauren and I really experienced this firsthand. Um, we had to switch between three different social enterprises um, due to the conditions that the pandemic presented. And so while this was initially very challenging, we learned to embrace um, the ambiguity and the excitement that comes along with it um, that's especially prevalent in the field of social entrepreneurship. And now as we reflect back on this challenge of ambiguity, we realize that this experience is very valuable. Um, it allowed us to strengthen our ability to be flexible in times of change. And we plan to, to carry the skill um, in the rest of our school year 
and as well in our future careers. So our next key finding is learning project management skills. So this is not only an essential part of the fellowship, but also for almost any career that we're about to go into. So you'll find that the fellowship has a lot of different moving parts and deliverables and being able to learn how to use management skills and effective communication has been key um, in order to uh, be conversational with each other and our teams and supervisors. Um, so Izzy and I have had to manage different email accounts to different social enterprises at the same time, as well as balancing schoolwork. Um, and so one of our favorite tools that we learned about was a time zone converter table because we had our CEO of Coco Tech in Germany, the employees were in Myanmar, and Izzy and I were in two different time zones in the US as well. So it's really important to have a plan and stay organized. Um, and we really grew as leaders to hold ourselves and others accountable. So our next key finding is about the value in learning and practicing how to communicate cross-culturally. Although when we initially accepted this fellowship, we expected to be doing cross-cultural communication in the field, we actually discovered that it is just as valuable of a skill when working remotely. If not, um, maybe even more valuable due to the lack of cultural context because you're not in the field and um, the barriers that technology uh, creates. And so one of the ways that we have effectively um, cross-culturally communicated is through storytelling. And storytelling has allowed us to connect on a deeper level with the people that we are working with. Um, it has also helped us to fully understand their values and intentions with the work that they are doing in their community. And so if you wanna work globally, like both Lauren and I do, um, this skill is absolutely essential. Not to mention, it has allowed us to to practice our clear communication skills, um, which is also very useful in um, remote research projects and remote schoolwork that we have been doing um, this past year. Great, we hope you enjoyed uh, watching a little portion of our video. If you feel inclined to watch the whole thing, um, you're able to find it on the Miller Center YouTube channel. Um, so I want to leave like a little bit of time for questions. So I'm just going to sum up our presentation by saying that um, the fellowship has provided us with so many techniques and teachings that has really allowed us to find where our passions and joy lie. Um, and this led us to discern the next steps in our professional careers. And we both decided that to apply to graduate schools. Um, so we will be hearing back from those soon and hopefully going this upcoming fall. And we're just very excited to practice the skills that we gained um, through the fellowship, like human-centered thinking, design thinking, empathetic leadership approaches, and working on the grassroots and community level. Um, so thank you so much for listening to our presentation. Are there any questions in the last couple minutes that we have? Oh, we can quickly answer um, Caitlin's question about grad school. So I actually applied to some schools internationally for um, health economics and global health and development. So I'm trying to combine my two majors of public health and econ um, and kind of gain some more technical skills um, about economic modeling in a public health field. And I am applying to masters of public health um, specifically with an emphasis in epidemiology. So I'm really excited to gain technical data skills so that I can apply um, quantitative data to a more qualitative and storytelling um, setting because I think both are so important um, when creating long lasting and sustainable change. Well, thank you again. Hi, everybody. My name is Brooke Van Zandt, and I study economics in the School of Business. When our journey on this fellowship initially began, it began with GOM Power, which is a social enterprise in Nepal that sells solar irrigation systems to smallholder farmers. Now, unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, we weren't able to travel to Nepal. And, but fortunately, we were able to work with Smart Havens Africa uh, virtually in Uganda. Smart Havens Africa is an affordable housing developer that 
uh, produces and sells affordable housing to low and medium income people in the capital city of Uganda, Kampala. And it sells these homes through its rent to own model, which provides a pathway to home ownership for people who might otherwise not be able to escape the rental poverty trap. So DJ and I produced two deliverables for, um, for and with Smart Havens. The first one was um, the business development report. So a couple of different things that Smart Havens wanted to do. Um, because it's a really early stage enterprise, they're still just kind of figuring out what type of people are, are prone to buy their homes and what type of people are the type of people that need their homes to be able to buy any home. Um, and then they also wanted to know what's working and what's not working in terms of customer satisfaction. Um, so before they start scaling, DJ and I talked to all of their customers to help both figure out um, the different improvements that can be made in future um, housing settlements, but also um, we did a market research survey with the Kampala public, um, figuring out what type of marketing mediums companies um, or people would, would respond to, and then also figuring out what aspects of homes were most important to them when they were looking to buy a house. So we drafted all this up in a big old business development report, and we gave that to Smart Havens, and um, it's, been, it's been pretty well received, so we're excited about that. Yeah, and so our second deliverable was a preliminary impact report. And the purpose of this report was to provide a data-driven analysis of Smart Haven's impact on its customers that it could then use to demonstrate to investors to gather resources. Um, the report also models a long-term framework, fr framework for mo um, monitoring impact for Smart Havens as it scales. So as of right now, Smart Havens has 15 homes built with people living in them, but it has just completed construction on 20 more homes and is on track to reach 100 by the end of 2021. And so developing this formalized means of monitoring impact is going to be important as Smart Havens grows into the future. But in terms of actually gauging impact in the short term, to do this, we compared two groups. The first group were Smart Havens customers, so the people who are currently living in a Smart Havens home. And the second group are Smart Havens applicants. And so these are the people who are waiting to get into their Smart Havens home. And to gather data from these people, we used two different surveys. The first survey was an online form that gathered qualitative data that between both the applicants and customers. And the second survey was a series of semi-structured interviews um, that we administered personally to just the customers. And this was to gather anecdotal evidence that we could then use um, to get, find more specific examples of impact. But when it came to the actual impact that smart, of Smart Havens found three main channels. And the first channel was through its rent to own model and the trust in the company. So through the rent to own model, uh, Smart Havens customers had confidence that they would be owning their own home. Uh, and they trusted the company too, that they would treat them more fairly than landlords they had previously worked with. And this was particularly shown in the case of just the coronavirus pandemic recently, as Smart Havens was very forgiving with late payments. The second channel of impact was actually the quality of SHA homes. These homes um, all come equipped with running water and flushing toilets, which might sound trivial, but for over a quarter of applicants come from homes that do not have either of these things. So they present major upgrades. Also, Smart Havens homes are larger, and so these quality upgrades present um, a possible, possible safety improvements for Smart Havens homes. 60% of applicants identified a safety risk in their homes, whereas half that 30% of Smart Havens applicants also identified a safety risk. But in keeping in mind that these Smart Haven applicants, customers were particularly worried about um, a fence gate around the community that was not being closed as their main safety concern. There's a gap in severity um, between these in that statistic, between the two groups in that statistic. And finally, um, the main, the third impact is the community that Smart Havens provides for its customers. So 90% of Smart Havens customers identified that the neighborhood, the Smart Havens neighborhood has a community and that they trust their neighborhood neighbors in that community. 
and this has particular impact on the kids, customers noted that they are willing to let their kids play outside and they feel that their kids are safe in the Smart Havens neighborhood, whereas that was not necessarily the case before. So with that, I think we are ready to jump into questions. Yeah, the first one just came in. Um, we were asked what was the most surprising aspect of our research this summer? So for that one, um, we actually, when we were doing the semi-structured interviews, um, people kept saying that there would be, it would be a good idea to have pit latrines um, built in the community. And at first we were a little confused as to why this was the case, but it turns out that um, water is not always um, reliable. And so because of that, the flushing toilets don't always work. So having these pit latrines are important for um, actually water shortages. But that's something that unfortunately we couldn't realize having not been there in person. I think it was a really good example for both DJ and I of, um, you know, we thought that having a flushing toilet would be a step up from having a pit latrine, but just because, um, you know, we weren't able to like be in the context of those communities, it was something that um, we were surprised about at first, but it makes total sense once you, once you learn why. Um, okay, next question coming in. Um, ooh, this is a good one. What did we learn from our um, virtual experience that we don't think we could have learned um, by going in the field. Um, I'll, I'll take one crack at this DJ and then let you chime in. But I think one thing that was really interesting um, for us is that we had to be a lot more intentional with our communication um, just because there's a longer turnaround when you can't actually be in an office and have a conversation with somebody. Um, so definitely got to practice cross-cultural cross -cultural communication and also virtual communication across time zones. Um, but another thing that I think DJ and I had to be more intentional about was our survey design because it took a lot longer to pilot surveys because there was a lot more coordination involved than if we were just able to, you know, try a question and then go ask somebody um, and see what type of response we, we had to get. We would, you know, create the question. We had to get it translated. We had to send it out. We had to like coordinate with somebody to actually go out and pilot the questions. We had to get the responses back and then have them translated again. And, um, you know, it'd be a lot more uh, simpler if we were in time. So um, we definitely put a lot more upfront investment in designing the survey questions um, than I think we would have if we were in the field. And speaking of the survey questions, um, we actually ended up for the market research uh, administering surveys through the Kampala area um, using automated phone calls going out to people. So this was something that we probably would not have done if we were actually there in person. But in administering these surveys, I did learn a new set of survey design skills that were, that were audio based and basically kind of somewhat one-sided as they weren't live. Um, I definitely wouldn't have done the the formatting for those and created those surveys had we actually been there in person, as we probably would have resorted to more traditional survey methods of just talking to people directly. Okay, last question before we're out of time. Um, DJ, this is something that I think both of us have touched on, but um, the last question is, how has this fellowship shaped um, your future career choices and decisions um, and how you think about what you wanna do down the road? Do you wanna start off? Sure. Um, so actually the fellowship, the mentorship that the fellowship provides definitely prov uh, gave me a helpful context for judging what exactly I want to do in the future. Before this fellowship, I kind of felt that there was a tension between creating impact and then having, say, a more stable corporate job. But seeing social entrepreneurship at work through the Miller Center and through the fellowship really gave me um, the sense that you can have both those things in a single career. Um, and that even if my first job right out of college does not meet all of my expectations, that it would still be okay. And that social enterprise entrepreneurship is still something I can head back into, whether that be right out of college or later on in the future. Yeah, DJ and I have talked a lot about what we're calling, you know, the false dichotomy between corporate and social impact. Um, 
and personally, I took a job with with a tech company after I graduate. And, you know, I was kind of feeling torn because I'm like, well, I really want, you know, to be working in the social space. And I kind of feel like I'm like selling out by going to this like nice, comfy, like career type job. And um, I think through the process of, of vocational discernment that we, you know, go through as fellows, it's really helped me to realize that um, this is a great stepping stone for me um, to build skills that I can use um, at any point in my career in any type of work that I want to be doing. Um, so that, you know, by taking this job, um, by no way am I ever like excluding myself from working in the social space. And in fact, I think I can um, build skills that would be hard to build in a, an explicitly socially focused company um, while I'm at this, you know, this company in this first job. So um, I think it's been a great reframing that has really prepped me well and uh, hopefully will, will serve, serve me well as I go on to my next, next job after this. Okay, I think we're out of time. So thank you all so much for coming, DJ, and I really appreciate it. And it's been super great talking with you. Thank you for listening to our talk. Hey, everyone, how are we doing? Great, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing well, thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to have everyone here this evening or this morning or wherever in time it is from wherever you are in the world. I am not too far from Santa Clara University, actually, in the Bay Area at home. Uh, my name is Ash. I am the host for this breakout session. I am a GSBF alumni from 2016 and a Santa Clara University alumni from 2017. Um, and I just wanted to welcome you all to join today. We are going to hear from both Nikki and Shelby about their time working with To Teach Amanda Fish, a Ugandan social enterprise that connects educators and students both inside and outside the classroom with the resources they need to succeed. Perfect, thank you so much, Ash. So with that, we will just kick off and go right into it. So hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as Nikki and I share our journey with the fellowship with you all. Uh, my name is Shelby White. I'm a communication major within the College of Arts and Science. Uh, my name's Nikki Kim. I study marketing within the business school. The last 10 months have been a whirlwind, something I'm sure we can all attest to. Um, and Nikki and I appreciate the opportunity to reflect on our time as fellows with you all this evening, um, starting from the very beginning. So with that, I will share our screen or my screen and we can go through everything together. Thanks, Shelby. Yeah. Give me a second here. Okay, well, perfect. Eh, we'll start on the second slide. <laughs> so yeah, starting from the very beginning. Uh, Nikki and I were awarded our positions within the fellowship way back before Corona BC in February 2020, um, specifically as partners to Teach Amanda Fish and their work with the Catholic Sisters in Uganda. Um, sounds super exciting, but we had no idea what that meant. <laughs> but we were looking forward to it anyway. Um, Nikki and I entered into this fellowship with a very limited understanding of what social entrepreneurship really was or what exactly we'd be doing with it. Um, but uh, neither of us really know what we wanted to do with our lives either. That was kind of another defining factor for the both of us. All we knew is that we wanted to help people and we wanted to learn from them in return. Um, so GSBF and our partnership with both Teach Amanda Fish and the Catholic Sisters seemed like a good place to start. Thanks, Shelby. I'm going to launch into a little background about what we were doing. So um, first of all, the mission of Teach Amanda Fish is to enable schools to provide a relevant education through enterprise, which empowers young people to succeed in work and in life. Next slide, please. Thank you. So Teach Amanda Fish does this by providing consultancy and resources to schools in developing nations to educate students in business practices and create businesses at schools, developing students as future job creators and community leaders, while also generating revenue for their schools. Next slide. Teach Amanda Fish in Uganda recently began a partnership with two Catholic secondary schools operated by sisters, Bone Conceal Girls Vocational Secondary School and Stella Matutina Girls Secondary School, 
to implement the Teacher Man to Fish school business model. Teacher Man to Fish went into this partnership not only to help the students at these two schools, but also with the hopes of tailoring their existing model to the sister schools so that it would be able to provide even greater value to this market in the future. Next slide. The two schools were run by sisters that were a part of the Sisters Blended Value Project, an initiative between Miller Center and the Association of Consecrated Women in Eastern, in Eastern and Central Africa, or CUECA, which is a program for sisters to learn how to become social entrepreneurs. Next slide. So in this role, way back when, Shelby and I were planning to work as consultants between the two schools and Teach Amanda Fish to understand and report how Teach Amanda Fish could tailor their program to better meet the needs of Catholic schools run by sisters. We planned to conduct in-person interviews and surveys along with other forms of research um, with both Teach Amanda Fish employees and Catholic school partners, as well as observe the interactions between them. Next slide. And then everything changed when COVID hit. <laughs> Suddenly international travel became laughably impossible and we were forced to figure out what remote engagement would look like with our partners in Africa. This question became that much more pressing when Teach Amanda Fish, our host organization, all but disappeared in response to the pandemic. <laughs> we were both woefully unprepared for such a drastic change in plans, but Teach Amanda Fish, who relies so heavily on in-person facilitation, stopped their activity entirely. And as frustrating as this was for us, it made sense. We were feeling the impacts of COVID-19 in our own education as the American school system struggled to adapt to an online format. In the developing world, access to technology was unreliable to begin with, making schooling nearly impossible for many online. As a supplemental business education consultancy, Teach Amanda Fish was no longer a priority for many of its partners. And for those whom it was still a priority, no one really knew how to bridge the, in, the seemingly insurmountable technological divide. Nikki and I were left scrambling for a sense of purpose and with far more questions than answers. What do we do now? <laughs> Like, what can we do as college students in the U.S. trying to work with students in Africa? How long was this going to last? And perhaps most importantly, what did our partners still need from us? So here it was, the perfect opportunity to practice mitigating ambiguity and maximizing challenge, two of the biggest tenets of GSBF. We realized that while Teach Amanda Fish might be out of the picture, the Catholic sisters had more need for support than ever before, and that there was room for us to personally fill the gap left by Teach Amanda Fish's absence. Though we didn't necessarily have answers to any of our questions or the issue of the tech divide, we chose to give our all to the sisters in the hopes that we'd figure it out along the way, even if we had to do that digitally. So with Teach Amanda Fish's lack of involvement with the schools and our newfound challenge of not being able to practically observe the interactions between them, we had to reevaluate the practicality of our role as consultants. Next slide. Instead of serving as consultants, we redefined ourselves as tutors who would work primarily with the sisters on their business acumen and prepare them for when Teach Amanda Fish came back into the picture. Next slide. We worked with Miller Center to co-create and pilot a farming enterprise playbook designed to teach sisters biz basic business skills so that they would be better prepared for Teach Amanda to Fish's curriculum when the, when the social enterprise resurfaced. Miller Center used our pilot version of the farming enterprise playbook and the insights we provided on how it could be improved to develop a revised version of the playbook, renamed the Farming Enterprise Workbook. This workbook is now required curriculum for all of the sisters in the Sisters Blended Value Project that provides a baseline understanding of entrepreneurship. Next slide. So as tutors um, for the past year, Shelby and I met weekly between April and October on Zoom with each school to accompany them through the playbook, business planning and implementation documents, social media, and the writing of their business plans. So you can see some of that there. Over the course of our fellowship, Nikki and I learned a lot about what it means to teach. And in fact, we both applied to be English teaching assistants through the Fulbright program. And we hear back this Friday, so fingers crossed on that. 
Um, throughout this experience, we developed a teaching philosophy centered around trust. It was a really big part of what we did with the sisters. Nikki and I found that the sisters did not feel comfortable asking questions right away. So we took an active interest in them as individuals. We began each meeting with an icebreaker or small talk for us all to get to know each other a little bit more. Eventually, these icebreakers became an extension of their lessons for the day. We also ended each meeting by asking for their feedback. We encouraged them to think critically about our time together and to assert their own learning needs. Nikki and I were then able to incorporate this feedback into our own lesson planning. And eventually we shared it with Teach Amanda Fish and the Miller Center as well. On a practical level, we learned that the original format of the Farming Enterprise Playbook or workbook, depending on what you wanna call it, um, was designed more for a desktop and wasn't really helpful for the sisters. Um, the sisters had limited access to computers and there were always difficulties with sharing permissions because we were using Google Slides. Uh, the playbook is now a PDF that can be easily shared over WhatsApp, um, which is a web-based messaging app that the sisters use as their primary means of communication. The new version of the playbook also contains structured worksheets to help guide the sisters through their lessons, uh, many of which we created as well. It didn't take long for Nikki and I to love the sisters. There was no end to their motivation or excitement. Uh, in many ways, they were model students. <laughs> they were quick to do what we asked of them, and they continually asked for more ways to be challenged. Some of the best parts of my day in lockdown were <laughs> when the sisters would send us pictures or videos of their progress. Um, it was obvious that they were proud of themselves, and they wanted us to be proud of them, too. I think it's safe to say that we are. All right. Thanks, Shelby, and thank you all again for your time and support. GSBF has been such a large component of our lives over the past several months, and it's really been a pleasure to, to get to share our highlight reel with you all. Um, and then on the next slide, we've included some themes from our fellowship to, to spark some inspiration for questions if needed. Um, but for now, we'd love to open up the floor to you if anyone has questions. So I can't resist as a um, self-proclaimed uh, mango lover. What what exactly do mangoes mean to you? <laughs> Perfect. I was really hoping that someone would ask us about this. Um, and Nikki, I'm sure we'll like tag team on these answers. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a very specific story that happened in May. So it was pretty um, pretty close to the beginning of the fellowship. But we were on a call with one of our um, congregations that we were working with. And I don't even know what we were talking about. Like the conversation happened so long ago, um, mm -hmm. but the sisters talked about how like maybe one day um, you guys could come and visit us. Like we would love to have you. We would love for you to try the mangoes. And Nikki and I just kind of looked at each other because I don't think we knew at that point that they like were growing mangoes. And that was like a part of their daily operation. Um, and they got so excited. They went outside and showed us this mango tree. And we, we spent so long just looking at this mango tree and talking about mangoes, and we just descended into laughter. Like, <laughs> we laughed for so long. At some point, I don't even think we were laughing about the mangoes anymore. We were just laughing at and with each other. Um, and it, it's such a small thing, but for me, that was like one of the best experiences that I had in this fellowship. It was so wholesome, so down to earth. Yeah. It was just so sweet. And I hope that one day I can try their mangoes. <laughs> Yeah, just to piggyback off of that, like that was just one of the most memorable little nuggets from our fellowship. And it, it was kind mm -hmm. of cool because it was kind of a reflection of a lot of the, the relationship building that we had done with the sisters because there was a language barrier there. And so there was a mm -hmm. limit to the conversations that we could have. But a lot of times we connected over laughter and that was just a big part of the fellowship. So thanks for sharing that, Shelby. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks for asking, Ash. <laughs> of course. So from the chat box, Emily asked, what are you both most proud of when you reflect on your time in the fellowship? Oh, that's a good question. Emily, I should have known that you would ask a good question like that. <laughs> um, I can start. Hi, Emily. Um, 
I think that something <laughs> when Shelby and I had like talked to fellows from the previous years, the like biggest thing about the fellowship is like there will be ambiguity and you have to learn how to navigate mm -hmm. it. And like you just can't be prepared by like to the level of what like how much ambiguity there will be. Um, and so I think like over the course of the entire fellowship, always navigating like not having much direction and no one have having done this before us. And so having to be creative and um, figure out how to still like go towards the mission of the social enterprise and of the sisters while um, with like very limited examples of what we should be doing. Um, I feel proud that we were able to navigate that and still still work towards those missions. That's such a good answer, Nikki. Oh my yeah. goodness. <laughs> it's very, very true. Very true. Um, I think for me, just so that I don't say the exact same thing, um, I'm also very proud of the relationships that we were able to build with the sisters because um, that really was the foundational element of our work. Like we wouldn't have been able to do anything if we hadn't have been able to have those conversations with them and to, you know, really get to know them as people. So, um, or if we wouldn't have those mango stories, right? Like those moments of shared laughter that became so precious, like all of that was encompassed within that relationship building. So I'm pretty proud of the fact that we were able to do that even virtually. Um, there were definitely challenges with that. Um, I mentioned the tech divide a few times in this presentation, but like that was a very real struggle. Um, so I'm proud of the ways that we um, overcame that together, us and them. So Shelby and Nikki, thank you so much for sharing your, your journey with us. And um, I think I recognize I, I, um, Sister Annalise and Sister Junza, were, were they in a couple of the pictures? I, I couldn't, I, I, I recognize the smiles. And so um, they actually visited Santa Clara and I, I had an opportunity to meet them. But um, share with, if you could share some of the storytelling, I was pretty interested in, in that piece, um, what, what, that, what that meant to both of you. Mm. Let's see. Shelby, do you want to start? Um, I just want to clarify the question really quick. I want to make sure I understand. Um, were you asking specifically about what it was like working with them? No, oh, actually, no. I, I was. That's just something that I was just, I just mentioned about, about. Um, but the, but switching over to the storytelling, I was, I was actually interested with that, what that term meant, meant to you. Yeah, totally. No, thank you for asking. Um, yeah. So storytelling was a huge part of our experience in working with the sisters for a variety of different reasons. Um, I will let Nikki talk about the African storytelling in a digital world portion. <laughs> that is one title, that is one thing. <laughs> Um, kind of confusing. Um, but just in general, I think Nikki and I realized pretty early on that stories were the easiest way to connect with the sisters because um, it was something we both had in common, right? Um, like either just sharing the stories of who we were and like our individual experiences or um, even like one of our icebreakers was asking them, like, can you tell us a traditional African story? Like we want to learn and listen to you. Um, and it kind of worked in a twofold way, right? Like those things helped further those relationships, but then um, it was also a way for us to try to teach them like a marketing rhetorical strategy that they would be able to use later on in their own business practices, um, which Nikki can talk a lot more <laughs> than I can about. Thanks, Shelby. Thanks, Shelby. Um, do we have time for? Yeah, so we've uh, we've gone to the break, um, but I just put the the doc to the other breakout rooms um, for anybody that would like to jump over. Um, but please finish the question. Cool. Yeah, kind of um, to piggyback off of Shelby and just finish this up. Um, another component of storytelling is just, like a really huge theme in our fellowship. Um, but something that we did with the sisters was work directly with them to learn social media. Um, or they were learning social media. And um, Africa is also often called the silent continent because other people are telling their stories. And so an initiative that Shelby and I were working on um, that was part of also work that the Miller Center was doing, actually Emily was working on it, um, was helping the sisters to, to get on social media and, and start telling their own stories. They're doing really amazing things in their communities and um, becoming social entrepreneurs and all of that deserves to be told to the world. And so um, that was something that we kind of started with all the, all the sisters, getting them on, on LinkedIn and, and Twitter and helping them to find their voices online. 
great. Well, thanks so much for sharing. This is, I'm, I'm sure this was, this is probably an experience that you, you definitely won't forget. I mean, <laughs> COVID added into the mix. And so thank you so much for sharing this with us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for your question and your time. Yeah. Thank you everyone again for joining. <laughs>